1984 is the dystopian novel by George Orwell that envisions most of the world population becoming victims of perpetual war, government surveillance, propaganda. 1984 is also an album by Van Halen, featuring such classic rock hits as Jump and Panama. I was there in 1984, and I can tell you from personal experience that the album was a lot closer than the book to catching the spirit of the time. Aside from raging guitar solos on the radio, MTV was only three years old. Movies like Footloose, The Terminator, Ghostbusters, and A Nightmare on Elm Street were released that same year. It was gnarly and decidedly non-oppressive. My school got a Macintosh computer, which Apple had unveiled in January of 1984. Honestly, Van Halen was more important to me then, but it's funny how something that seemed somewhat inconsequential or a novelty at the time has gone on to become a major part of our lives. Think about that timeline, starting with the 1984 release of the Macintosh. Once more big money players got in the game, like IBM or Texas Instruments, things really started to get moving. Microsoft, hey, Windows, and PCs, everything started getting smaller, faster, more memory and less space, and portable. Modems, dial-up, the internet, and so on down the line. I don't know that any of us besides Gene Roddenberry, Steven Spielberg, and George Lucas could imagine the future possibilities. Now here we are with robo-vacuum cleaners, smart home technology, and voice-activated AI personal assistants. Available everywhere. Commonplace, actually. With all these incredible innovations comes new legal issues and practice areas like IP law, cyber squatters, e-commerce tax laws, internet privacy. None of these things existed in 1984 either. There are so many amazing technological advances happening today. It's a wild time to be alive, even if we don't do feathered hair and parachute pants anymore. Society and the laws that guide it are going to change too, just as they did from 1984 up to now. And that's what we're talking about today on Lawson. Technology, torts, teaching with Twitter tags, and the future of law in a rapidly changing world. Let's jump in. Lawson. The podcast for law firms. Powered by ConsultWebs. Welcome back to Lawson, the only podcast for law firms that rolls with the punches and gets to what's real. We're here to inform, educate, and entertain the legal community on the latest in personal and professional developments. I am Jake Sanders. I get up and nothing gets me down. And standing here with his back against the record machine is Paul Julius. Baby, how you been? Oh, I am itching to just throw a guitar solo in right here. <laughs> Thank you. That was ideal. I feel better now. Um, is there anything else you want to say? Anything Van Halen related or you just, everything I say is Van Halen related. You just have to look for the, for the, the key (laughs) and the, and the giant hair. I speak crypto Van Halen. (laughs) And he's crimped his hair and he has like huge hairspray and tight pants. That's right. And back in the day. What do you mean back in the day? Now. (laughs) Right now. You see? <laughs> Tell these people what's on the show today. On the show, we check out the torts of tomorrow with an article from DMV on driverless cars. And we ain't talking about love. We're talking about scooters and robots with forward-leading law professor Tracy Pearl from Texas Tech University. And then we make it hot for teacher as we roast our guest with the scorching five questions we ask everyone. Pull up a plate. It's the Hot Takes Buffet. The article today is from the DMV.org, and it took us 40 minutes waiting in line to get to the article. (laughs) It's rough. (laughs) It's by Bridget Clerkin, and the title is, How Do You Sue a Self-Driving Car? Paul, you want to tell us a little background about this? You found this one. So basically, this article, to give you an overview, is autonomous cars may be easily acquiring the skills needed to drive, but it's much harder for the technology to take responsibility for any accidents it could cause on the road. So start laying the legal groundwork needed to navigate through such uncertainty. Many in the world of law have turned to the idea of strict liability, which would hold a vehicle manufacturer accountable for any incidents caused by a defect with the car. However, some speculate that autonomous vehicles could be designated a service 
which would make the ride subject to contract law, a body of rules that would skew very favorable for business. This is not without potential complications. For contract law, you'd have to accept the terms and conditions, which could include mandatory arbitration agreement, preventing users from suing service providers in the case of an accident or joining a class action lawsuit. Mm. Technology of tomorrow will quickly test the laws of today, and it won't be long before the consensus of industry titans or even the perfect video recall of an event data recorder won't be enough to determine who's at fault in a world where vehicles can think for themselves. Wow. That's crazy, man. I know. It's a strange thing. Late, later on in the, in the article, uh, there's a quote. It says, frankly, I think lawmakers are a little overwhelmed. With good cause, the process of creating laws needs to take its course, and it's time-consuming and important to write it in a way that, in two years, that law doesn't become obsolete. Um, <laughs> man, it's funny because Tr Tracy, later on in the interview, talks about the two different ideas. is the traditional way that law keeps up with product, liability, and all those things, and then new, alternative, non-existent ways that the law needs to deal with it because this stuff is happening right now and a lot of this stuff is focused on is it fully autonomous cars or is it just self-driving cars is is do they make that distinction it says it's self-driving cars is it fully autonomous is that what they're talking about i think so yeah yeah, yeah. I, I, level I, well, five the, automation okay here it is yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 they they do say at the beginning they're talking about you know right now there's you know, still kind of this in between thing. And I think that's interesting. I mean, you know, it, it, and we have that now, I think people mm -hmm. are pretty used to cars that will park themselves, <laughs> you know, or, right. or like you talk about things, you know, um, your, your lane warnings, mm -hmm. you know, or stuff like that. Stuff, yeah. Um, and, and there's things that, yeah. And it'll automatically break, you know, there's that accident prevention thing that a lot of cars have where, you know, the, the front sensors will detect badness about to occur and, and, right. and stop the car for you. Right. Right. And then, but then, what happens if that malfunctions? Who can trace back all of those um, points and binary codes that 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 you know made that autonomously happen in my car? That's going to become more complicated. And so this from the DMV is kind of cool. They're looking forward into that. They they have uh, they they interview a lot of um, uh, legal scholars and personal injury lawyers who are talking about this, but they, they have horses in this race. Absolutely. Which is interesting. Um, and a lot of those horses might just disappear because we won't be in danger of hitting horses with cars anymore. Um, yeah. I mixed yeah. my metaphors, but that's okay. It works. Um, and, and we talk about that later. And I think that's an interesting thing that the, 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 I don't know that people even fully realize the impact, you know, that, that, these things are going to have on society right. in a bigger way, like all kinds of different, you know, revenue streams or, um, you know, jobs, things like that are, are, are it's going to change. Mm. A lot of articles are written with regards to the trucking industry, mm -hmm. you know, and I think it's pretty obvious if you have driverless trucks, there's all kinds of things that are going to change. Number one, you're going to have all these unemployed truck drivers. Mm -hmm. Um, there's going to be no, you know, right now they have to have uh, logs. You know, you're only allowed to drive for X amount of hours without, you know, taking a rest for X amount of hours. Um, that won't matter. So moving goods around will be a lot faster, mm -hmm. a lot cheaper. Um, but then on the flip side of it, we're going to have all these kind of, you know, here's here's an entire travel, you know, transportation sector that's wiped out. Oh, yeah. It just doesn't and, exist anymore. And the businesses in between the highways connecting Boom. the various yeah. places, yeah. gone now. Truck stops, so, gone. So, it, and, and the reason I bring that up is that I think there's parallels to law with that stuff. And I sure. think it's important to keep that in mind. But at the same time, I don't want everybody thinking that, well, you know, we're going to have driverless cars and it's just going to mean we have a whole bunch of different ways to sue people and different people to sue. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think we're looking at, at, at a net gain. <laughs> when you're talking about these, some of these automations and, and stuff like that. So I don't want, uh, this to be looked at as kind of a negative thing. And, you know, I hate to say when one door closes, another one opens, but you just, you can't figure out what's going to happen in the future like that. You know, and we talk about it later. And, and, and I don't and know. I, what did you think? No, no, I, I, I think you can't figure out what's going to happen. And a lot of lawyers are sitting on the sidelines wondering, um, but we talked to Tracy Pearl, who's a professor looking into the future with bionicle, uh, you know, bi binoculars. 
Bionicle Chronicles. Bionicle right. Chronicles. Nice. Um, but there is potential. There is amazing um, opportunity. But where, where, where is it coming from? Who's going to be there? And I, I think lawyers should should take a note from this conversation because the type of law you're going to be practicing in ten years it may not even exist right now. So what, how, how do you plan for a career? What's your five-year plan look like if 10 years into the future, you're a machine risk officer? That's a really good point. And, and I think you mentioned it later in the interview, just saying, you know, while this may not be having a, a huge impact right this second, it's in, in, uh, in the legal industry, it's important for lawyers to get involved and get involved now. You know, just in the conversation and just, yeah. just, just getting familiar with the language. Well, even how to shape the conversation, Yeah, you know, even saying like, wait a minute, this isn't, here's some problems with how we think about this. Is an autonomous car a service? Mm-hmm. You park a service in your garage? I mean, mm. I don't know. Mm. Interesting. Yeah. So, so negligence, torts, uh, new technology, everything's coming together. We're going to be seeing the world different. Um, and we're going to be spotting negligences, uh, you know, left and right, but how are we going to behaving as, as a culture? And then where are lawyers going to interface in between society rules, um, norms, morals, ethics, you know, it's just another day on the Lawson podcast. That's right. Stay tuned as we continue on a very special episode of Lawson. Any lawyer looking to grow their business online can generate more leads from their website by hiring ConsultWebs. After working with lawyers exclusively since 1999, we've tested thousands of web designs and marketing strategies, so we know what flips and what flops. For more information, visit www.consultwebs.com today. And now, for a lawsome interview. Tracy Pearl is professor of law at Texas Tech University. She is a nationally recognized scholar on emerging technology in the law and researches and writes extensively about risk, regulation, and tort law in the areas of driverless vehicles, the Internet of Things, and other new forms of technology. Professor Pearl is admitted to practice in Massachusetts, the District of Columbia, and the United States Courts of Appeal for the First, Fourth, and Tenth Circuits. We were first introduced to her on Twitter, where she's using the platform in a unique way to interact with her students in the community, and that led us down the path to the present, where she has graciously taken the time out of her day to join us on the Lawson Podcast. Professor Pearl, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, You've incorporated social media, like we said, um, into your teaching in some unique ways, and I'm talking about hashtag spot the negligence. Um, (laughs) What, can you tell us uh, about that and then what was uh, kind of the reaction? Yeah, so I um, always joke around that there is a law school equivalent to medical school syndrome, right? So med school syndrome is that first year medical students think that they have all the diseases that they're reading about. Um, and I think law school student for first year law students is that when you start studying negligence, um, you start walking around the rest of the world seeing negligence everywhere and annoying your friends and family members by pointing it out. Um, so I thought I would actually turn that into a pedagogical <laughs> opportunity. So um, when we start negligence in my fall torts course, um, I hand out a flyer for the spot the negligence competition. And I tell students that as they are going about their business in the greater world, as they see potential instances of negligence to take photographs of the circumstances and to post them on Twitter under the spot the negligence hashtag. And then I invite um, everybody, really, the general public, the law school people in the class to like the tweets that they think are best representative of negligence. And then we have a final round with the top five vote earners where they have to make their case as to why their uh, spot the negligence submission was the very best of the year. Um, And then we award prizes. So it's really fun. The students love it. Uh, More and more people in the general public um, love it and actually are participating. So this year we got submissions, not just from members of my class, but from India, from law students at other schools, um, from a law professor at another school. So it's just sort of taken off. So you got some pushback from lawyers. It's interesting to go down because there's some people that are like, wait a minute. Um, (laughs) 
<laughs> well, I mean, obvious, obviously, you know, if you're having a good time, a lawyer will come up and be like, did you know <laughs> this is a hundred percent? Yeah. Right. So how, how about, so you got positive feedback, but what was the negative feedback? What was that kind of curtailing? Because here you are, you have a negligence. Do what, what is the, do what's, what's the, what's the, what's the negative side of this thing? Yeah. What are people complaining about? <laughs> um, yeah. So. You know, I've done this competition for a number of years, and for this year, this year it went viral in sort of the legal academia sphere for some reason. I'm not sure why. Um, and so I got pushback from, you know, I would say, you know, five to ten percent of the people who were sort of responding to the tweets, and they were saying um, that the law school, Texas Tech Law School, was going to get sued for defamation, mm. that we were going to get sued for negligence, which I thought was particularly interesting, um, and that they were gonna, we were going to get sued for bad faith. And so, you know, people told me that I needed to lawyer up, that they hoped that I had insurance. Um, and I, I found it hilarious because, you know, I was sort of thinking through their arguments. And I, at first, I thought, like, gosh, what have I not thought about here? Um, but, you know, I, I actually did some legal analysis with my tort student to figure out if, you know, we were going to run afoul of some sort of common law principle. And I feel confident that the that the competition is totally fine, but there are always going to be people who, uh, who push back. Um, but, you know, the criticism got so amplified at one point that I actually had to go downstairs to our dean and say, you know, hey, there's some things happening on Twitter that I think you should know about. Um, and we're getting this sort of pushback this year. And, and he was incredibly supportive, um, but, but told, but essentially said like, we should alert the university general counsel's office that <laughs> this competition is going on. Um, oh, but I'm really yeah. careful in, in how I set this up. So, you know, I don't allow my students to take pictures of people who are involved or presumably involved in the negligence. So they can't take pictures of injured people. They can't take pictures of the people who have created the negligent conditions. Um, and it's also in the rules of the competition that if students can safely and legally remediate the negligence after they've taken a picture, that they have an obligation to do so. So, for instance, this year, uh, this was really hilarious. Uh, somebody actually found a banana peel on the floor of their local <laughs> supermarket. It was like something out of a movie. Um, totally. So he, did, he took a picture of the banana peel and then picked it up and threw it away to <laughs> make the situation safer for everybody involved. Nice. Well, that's yeah. interesting. Well, I was curious. Some of the ones that I saw, uh, and I yeah. don't want to, I, I don't want to spend the entire podcast talking about this, but I'm just curious because some of the ones that I saw where the lawyers were coming back and they're like, by posting this, doesn't this create some kind of now you have to take action on this, right. and and so you really did. So did you like sit, you know, sit down with your students and talk about that, and 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 what happens. Um, if someone like what if someone wasn't doing this as uh, a, a class thing, and but yeah. actually just posted it on social media, like, look, I got this. This happened to me, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you know, this that those comments actually provided a great teaching opportunity because uh, when all of this sort of happened, we were going through the duty element of negligence, and you know one the fundamental principles is that generally a duty arises from undertakings and not from omissions, right? This is like going okay. way back into first year torts. Um, so generally speaking, you don't have a duty to help or assist people, right? With some limited exceptions. You know, I always tell my students, you know, if you see somebody drowning in a pool and you're not the ones who put them there, you can stand on the side of the pool and, and watch them drown, right? Like you're going to go to hell but it's not going to be a tort necessarily, <laughs> unless there's right, unless there's some sort of statute in the in the state that would impose some sort of Good Samaritan uh, liability. So, so you know, I thought those comments on Twitter were so interesting because, generally speaking, you don't have a duty just because you've observed something that's dangerous or risky wow. to people. Wow. And there's you know great policy debates that we can have about that. But from a common law perspective, you know, almost certainly you don't have a duty to sort of fix the situation just because you've observed it. Changing gears to driverless cars and yeah. completely intended, we think there's great potential here, but you've written about problems with regulations. And specifically, you said lawmakers, however, motivated by irrational fears and unfounded assumptions that human drivers are far superior to automated technologies, have begun passing driverless car laws that create significant liability issues while doing very little to enhance road safety. What do you think effective regulation of self-driving cars looks like? Yeah, that's that's a great question. So yeah, I want to start by saying that I am incredibly optimistic about driverless cars. I'm a driverless car fan. 
I always tell people my goal is to promote driverless cars so that by the time my children are teenagers, they will never have to get their licenses or get into cars with other teenagers who might be driving. So, mm-hmm. you know, I think that they're going to be an incredibly beneficial form of technology for society. But I think that we're making a lot of mistakes in this sort of early phase of regulation. And the big mistake that I see lawmakers making is that they're rushing to regulate the fully driverless cars that are not yet available to consumers, while almost completely ignoring the semi-autonomous cars that are already on U.S. roads. And I think that this is incredibly risky because I am convinced that semi-driverless cars are far more dangerous and create far more risk than the fully driverless cars that we will eventually be able to buy. And here's why. So um, I I have a Tesla and it has an autopilot system um, that allows the car to steer itself, to accelerate and brake on its own. And it's it's called autopilot, right? It sounds like it can essentially drive the car on its own. But in reality, systems like Autopilot and Super Cruise and some of the other semi-autonomous systems that we see on roads right now um, are are really essentially being beta tested on consumers and are not yet at the level that they can be safely used without driver supervision. The problem is the, the studies that are coming out have shown that drivers are not paying attention to their semi-autonomous cars. They set the autopilot and then they pick up their phones and start texting, or they set the autopilot and they start staring out the window. Um, And so when their cars encounter situations in which the autopilot cannot function safely, drivers don't step in quickly enough and accidents can result. And I worry about that a lot, and that's an issue that regulators have not been tackling at all. On the other hand, regulators have been rushing to pass state laws placing all kinds of restrictions on the fully autonomous vehicles that just aren't even yet available to consumers. And I, and I think that's a mistake because I think that those vehicles are going to be much safer than human driven cars or the semi-autonomous cars that we have now. So I, I think my hope is that the future of successful regulation lies in much tighter oversight of sort of this in-between phase of the technology and greater trust that by the time fully autonomous cars are on the road, that they're going to be significantly safer than what's available now. Does that make sense? Yeah. (laughs) I'm (laughs) sorry. I'm sorry. I was just in my driverless car. Uh, (laughs) I'm I'm actually doing this podcast from my car. Um, Yeah, not paying attention to the road. (laughs) (laughs) I'm driving right now. like, you know, I, I research and study this issue, you know, for a living, basically. Yeah. And when I set the autopilot in my car, it's like trying to engage in this weird form of mindfulness meditation where, like, I have to be in the moment and I have to be paying attention to what the vehicle's doing and what's happening on the road. But I'm also just sitting there, right? I'm not controlling the vehicle, I'm not steering, I'm not doing anything. And it's really hard to pay attention when you're sort of just sitting there doing nothing. It, it, it's like all of the skills that I'm not good at. <laughs> right. Well, and 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 just in, in a previous episode, um, I, I worked for a personal injury law firm and I did a lot of um, blogging and content on the safety considerations around cars today, like lane departure, uh, you know, just yeah. small yeah, little, yeah. Um, small little sensors uh, that are already making people unsafe drivers. They are not driving yeah, defensively right. because they feel like they don't have to. I have beepity and boopity. Uh, so if anything goes wrong, yeah. I'm looking for the beeps, got the boops. Um, but by yeah. the time you're, you're, the auditory signal comes from, uh, you know, you're, you're in somebody else's trunk. Um, yeah. but so re- regardless, so talking about sensors, cameras, uh, now nanny cams, cameras on your doorbells, <laughs> uh, you know, these scooters that are everywhere, social right. media, live streaming, augmented reality, the internet of things. What are you seeing is the future of torts and negligence claims? We are already at a point where technology has far exceeded the law's ability to keep up with it in any meaningful way. And I think there are sort of two camps of thought on this issue. You've got sort of the traditionalists who are out there saying, look, negligence and products liability have dealt with all kinds of innovation before, and they're going to be able to do it successfully, you know, here and in the future. And so there's not much that we need to do other than trust the system. 
And then I think there are people on the other side, people like me who are saying, you know, yeah, there's always going to be the classic negligence claim. There's always going to be products liability. But functionally, if we want to keep these forms of technology safe, we want to keep consumers safe, that we need stopgap measures or we need to think about alternatives for dealing with technology at the pace at which it's advancing. Um, so I'm right now working on an article that's going to come out in the William and Mary Law Review, arguing that maybe a victim compensation fund needs to be created for victims of driverless car crashes, right? And, and by crashes, I mean crashes actually caused by some sort of like malfunction of the car itself. Um, just because I, you know, I, I, I seriously question whether or not we're going to be able to build up jurisprudence in and around artificial intelligence issues, machine learning issues, um, as quickly as the technology is going to advance. And I also, I mean, I've worried about this for a long time. You know, I, I, I've seen for years sort of a gap between what the judiciary understands about technology and what is actually happening, right? This is why e-discovery was a mess for so long, is that, you know, Judges tend to be older um, because that's sort of how that career path works. Um, and so you had judges ruling on e-discovery issues who were still having their emails printed out by their assistants, right? <laughs> right? And that doesn't make for that doesn't make for good comprehensive jurisprudence. Um, so you know, for me, I, I'm more and more interested in alternatives to the tort system. I'm interested in specialty courts and victim compensation funds and other ways of thinking about dealing with this risk in a way that both protects consumers, but also, you know, allows for innovation in, in the market. It's interesting to hear you say that, particularly about e-discovery and stuff like that, because we've had guests on the show and we've talked about um, machine learning, AI, uh, you know, document preparation, e-discovery, mm -hmm. stuff like that before. And and one thing that's been brought up is, is um, responsibility. Who's, who's yeah. responsible for that? What, yeah, yeah. And, and I'm curious, how does that go in, in kind of a larger sense? I mean, if in, you know, one of these things were deep into fully automated cars or whatever, I mean, what, do we sue an engineer? Like who's, yeah, who's yeah. responsible? Yeah, a programmer or is it nobody at all? Yeah, I mean, that, that's a great question. And there are, you know, coming up on hundreds of law reviews, articles about well, who is responsible. Is it is it the, the driver? A lot of state laws that are being passed in and around driverless vehicles actually make the person who engages the autonomous system responsible for what that system does, which is terrifying, right? I can't think of a quicker way to convince people not to use driverless cars than to tell them that they're going to be the ones on the hook if something goes wrong and there's like a software malfunction. Um, so, you know, I don't know that our traditional models of liability work particularly well in an AI or machine learning context, right? Like, I, I just don't know that we even have jurisprudence that's meaningful, right? Like, if you look, for instance, at basically all automobile-related uh, jurisprudence for the last hundred years, it all has it, it has all assumed that there is a human making decisions behind the wheel, right? And so, when you have a fully autonomous vehicle, none of that's applicable anymore. Um, so, so where do we go from there? And that's that's why I'm dubious by the sort of traditionalist assertion that hey, tort law has dealt with all kinds of things before, and it'll continue to deal with these things well in the future. Like, I, I just don't know that's the case when we remove human decision making from the fundamental calculus. So in a society that's already perceived by some as overly litigious, mm. all of these emerging tech and brand new jobs, just recently that, that Java air crash, uh, yeah. that, that plane went down because there was something that went wrong with an autopilot, autocorrect thing that none mm -hmm. of the pilots knew about who right. is to blame for those things. I, but now who... Would the families of the victims in, in that plane crash, um, who would the families of these victims uh, of all of these data breaches, um, certain mm -hmm. things that are happening right now, is all this emerging tech just going to give more people opportunity to take advantage of the system? Or is it, is it, is it going to lean towards Sue happy? Or if we don't know who to sue, <laughs> how could you be yeah. happy about it? <laughs> I'm actually sort of optimistic on that front. I, I don't see there being, you know, flood uh, floodgates of litigation suddenly opened here for two reasons. Number one, you know, my hope is that a lot of this emerging technology is going to decrease personal injury pretty significantly. And I, I certainly believe that about driverless cars. If you look at sort of 
what the auto insurance industry is saying right now amongst themselves, they're all terrified by fully driverless cars because it's going to put them out of business, right? I mean, 94% of all car crashes are caused by human driver error. So when you take a human out of the driver's seat, you know, presumably we may, we're going to re reduce the number of accidents on the road by you know, upwards of 90%. Um, and my hope is that other forms of, of new technology are going to decrease risk as well. I think secondly, you know, these are going to be thorny, expensive cases to litigate. And so, you know, I don't know that anybody's going to be super excited about having to plow new ground on a machine learning case in a, in a court, right? I mean, that's going to be that's going to be an uphill battle for, for any plaintiff. Um, so, so my hope is that there's not sort of a flood of litigation, that it stays the same, if not decreases. That's interesting about the car. And I'm a, I'm a huge fan of, of driverless cars. I think it's going to be great, particularly, you know, if, uh, I mean, think about just for, you know, for people who have mobility issues or whatever, Yeah, right. you know, right. I mean, that's an amazing leveling field, a uh, leveling Absolutely. thing for them. Um, but it, it, you know, it's kind of weird too. Like you look at it, it's, you have like the societal perspective and then you have like the legal perspective and think about, we were, we just talked about this the other day, Jake, like mm -hmm. DUIs, mm -hmm. that's going to yeah. be gone. That entire <laughs> right, practice right, right, area right. is going to be gone. Yeah. All yeah. that revenue that counties and, and, and cities get. And yeah. it's, it, it's kind of a terrible thing to say because as a society, wow. like obviously you don't want DUIs, but at the same time, you know, you're saying 94% of these things, I mean, the car, everybody should be afraid of, what is this going to do? Like, how yeah, is this? It's going to affect things on a huge level. And then on the hidden impact of that, in just regard to the DUI, um, the counseling that comes from that, the problem yeah. of the alcohol cessation programming, all the money that goes into the coffers to, to make sure that there are some kind of remedial measures, some rehabilitative structures around those yeah. crimes or, you know, um, you know, things that have been perpetrated. Once those perpetrations go, how does the healing come from and where does it right. come from unless it's court mandated? If, if right. I can just get hammered and just fall into a minivan, um, right. what, what imp impetus do I have to maybe – it's scary. Wow. Yeah. Good yeah. point. Dude. Oh my I gosh. Never thought about that. Yeah. And it's not just that. I mean, we're going to lose parking revenue is going to disappear, right? Yep. We're not going to need parking lots anymore. And that's going to reshape how just the physical layout of our cities in a really profound way. Um, mm. Mm. So, so yeah, I think people sort of haven't fully thought through everything this is going to mean for American society. Mm. Like we do. Like yeah. we do. <laughs> um, <laughs> So, so Tracy, um, we we could keep going, and I think we we will really quickly, really quickly. Yeah. Scooters, are you excited yeah. about all of the? No, the, no. <laughs> just I just talk about scooters, scooters because we uh, no. So yeah. So the other day, um, we did this big head injury case in my torts class, um, mm. and and I went and left campus for lunch. And I come back and there's a group of my tort students who are riding one of those bird scooters around the traffic circle and in front of the entrance of the law school. And they're riding them um, without helmets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy. And they said, Professor Pearl, do you want to ride one? And I said, no. And you should get off of them without a helmet. This is incredibly dangerous. Did you not learn anything from torts this morning? <laughs> So yeah, I just think of those as just a massive class action waiting to happen. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, oh. so so okay, we've gone down this path. So I have to ask a follow up with that. Um, yeah, yeah. So I'm not too sure. I I don't have those here yet, or I haven't been on one because I yeah. I don't know. Whatever. I'm an old guy. But um, the point is, is is and I've seen this in um, use it with the autonomous cars and stuff too. Is that is it a service? Or is right. it a thing? So if right. I'm using it as a service and there's a service right. agreement that I have agreed to that contains mm. clauses in there that says I can't sue you if something goes wrong, I've waived that right. Like, yeah. what happens? Yeah, yeah. That, they're going to be great cases and I can just see the plaintiff's attorneys just salivating right now as I watch <laughs> all the college students yeah. riding around without helmets on these things. You know, and the other thing I saw the other day, I, I don't I don't know what this is, but I was driving home, I was in my neighborhood and there were two, I don't know, roughly nine year old girls 
riding a moped that's like kid size, like a, yeah. like a miniature moped that goes as fast as a normal moped. And these two little girls were on the same moped and they too weren't wearing helmets. They just thought, oh my goodness, this is just a disaster waiting to happen. This is why it's just so depressing to be friends with the tort professors because I drive around and think about head injuries. And You got to be out. taking pictures. Well, I guess you can't take pictures because <laughs> it's got people in it. But I mean, it's yeah. funny. I mean, look at that. It's an interesting contrast because here's things, you know, we're talking about you know, in the future and all these things being gone. Um, and there's people who this stuff isn't even automated and they're still making bad decisions. Right. Oh yeah. Right, right, right. I actually had to, this is another thing. I, I was at a stop sign in my neighborhood and there was a kid riding a bike who was texting while biking also without a helmet yeah. who almost ran directly into my car because he didn't see it stopped at the stop sign. So I had to get on our neighborhood Facebook page and sort of gently suggest that parents, have a conversation with their kids about not texting while biking. And I just thought like, this is the most 2018 Facebook post. Oh, yeah. <laughs> right? Talk to your kids about the dangers of texting while biking. <laughs> also wear a helmet. <laughs> well, yeah, no, I'm, yeah, I, it's, it's going to get more confusing. Um, so I think we need to have you back on because sure. pretty soon they're going to have electric scooters that come with vape juice flying out the back of them. I mean, and, and it's just like, and they run on bitcoins. Roaming lettuce just shooting into your <laughs> Oh my god! <laughs> the I whole think it's thing. funny though. The thing about the scooter, one thing that Jake brought up was that people just leave them everywhere. So now there's, you know, somebody trips over one of these things, right, right. or you know? or leaves it oh, leaves it on a you know a depression on the sidewalk where people use their wheelchair to get up. Now I yeah. can't get through. We could keep going on, but in some weird way, it, it's like. You sound like the olds um, because we're just complaining. Get off off that scooter. Get (laughs) off your vape juices. Um, But, you know, (laughs) I I, I think it's something that we have to contend with. And this show wants lawyers to be there. Um, I look at all these hackathons and all these, you know, places where they're just creating AI, uh, you know, to deal with AI contract reviews, to write the contract review. Lawyers should be freaking out. And should be demanding a seat at that table. And, you know, we're just so far behind. There's a great uh, law and technology conference every year called We Robot. Um, And I was at We Robot a year and a half ago. And they have what's called a lightning round. So after Mm. all of the formal presentations, they have other legal scholars and lawyers stand up and give just like a minute and a half sort of summary of a legal issue they're seeing. And just one after the other, it was like somebody who would stand up and say, you know, they're using drones to transport abortion drugs to countries that don't allow abortions. And the next person would stand up and say, you know, people are putting pornography on refrigerators because of the Internet of Things. And I just sat there and I just grew more and more uh, anxious, like, oh, my gosh, we don't have a handle on any of this, legally speaking. You know, it's just like... Whew, there is a vast world that we have not thought about at all as a legal system. How can people learn more about you, Tracy? Sure. They, so they can find me on Twitter at Prof Tracy Pearl. Um, I'm going to put out a plug. I run a, a law-related film uh, series every semester at the Alamo Draft House in Lubbock, Texas. So we screen one movie a month on the first Tuesday of the month at 7 p.m. Um, so if you're in West Texas, please come and join us. We have we show a really interesting film, and then we have a discussion about the legal issues therein afterwards, and we award prizes. So, so come to Lights, Camera, Law, my film series, and love that kid you're out in this, in this area. Um, and you can, of course, look me up on the Texas Tech Law website. Five questions we ask everyone. Number one, yeah. what was the last book you read? Ooh, uh, that's non-law related. Uh, I just reread uh, Lincoln and the Bardo. I'm a I'm a nonfiction gal, so I don't read a lot of novels. But Lincoln and the Bardo blew me away earlier this year, so I, I just reread it, and I highly recommend it. Ooh. Excellent. Number two, what is your favorite place? Ooh, North Shore of Oahu. I grew up in Hawaii, and the North Shore of the island on which I grew up, Oahu, is the most beautiful beautiful area of the United States, in my opinion. How nice. Number three, what sites, blogs, newsletters, or podcasts do you regularly check in with? 
Uh, the two best law professor blogs out there are Prof's blog and the Faculty Lounge. So I read those every day. Um, on the podcast front, I just finished the New York Times podcast Caliphate, which was phenomenal. Um, Listen to that one. And I also just finished uh, the podcast called The Dream, which is a deep dive into the crazy world of MLMs. And I would recommend that one as well. Ooh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm interested. Okay. Yeah. Uh, number four, if you were stranded on a desert island and could mm -hmm. only pick one condiment to take with you, <laughs> what would it be? You know, I feel like the cool kid answer here is sriracha or like Cholula, but mm -hmm. I'm going to go with butter because it makes everything taste better. I think butter's the cool kid answer. Butter so, is the, the answer. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. It's the only answer. That's the only correct answer to number four. All right. Um, number five, we made it to the end. After a long day or a long week at work, how do you relax and unwind? Oh, I'm terrible at that. Uh, I have this sort of Sisyphe Sisyphusian battle of trying to get through the, the pile of New Yorkers next to my bed. So that's what I'm usually doing is try to trying to get that pile down to something more manageable. <laughs> For show notes, links, and info, go to thelawsonpodcast.com or follow us on Twitter or Facebook. Be sure to leave us a review and rating in iTunes or wherever you find the you listen to. Until next week, stay Lawson. Awesome.